Hello and welcome to week 11 of Introduction to Psychology. Today we're going to be talking about chapter 12, Emotions, Stress, and Health. So when we go to talk about everything in this chapter, we really need to take a biopsychosocial approach, okay? So our emotions are influenced by our, by our body, okay? Our brain interprets the stimuli from our body and has emotional responses to that, okay? How we interpret our emotions, how we use language to define and categorize our emotions as a psychological process. And then the, where we learn our language from, where we learn the categories from of how to, for example, label our emotions and know how to express our emotions in the social context, you know, that comes through the socialization process, interacting with society in general, okay? So we need to take a biopsychosocial approach to this whole chapter. So what are emotions? Again, there are physiological responses, neurological responses, and then there are stimuli in the social context that cause emotional responses in us, okay? So not only do I feel emotions, but if I see someone else having an emotional moment, maybe crying, why do I find myself crying? Because my cognitive appraisal of the incoming stimulus from that person crying is creating a biological response in me, and now I'm crying because they're crying, okay? Hence the biopsychosocial, okay? So how do we measure emotions? We can do it by self-report. What are you feeling? Describe that feeling. Does it overlap with other feelings, okay? Then we have our micro expressions, these emotional expressions in the moment that can be observed, the behavioral expressions. And then we have the physiological measures, okay? Our biological measures, okay? What is happening in our body? What systems are being activated, okay? Our auto autonomic nervous system. And then within that, you have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, okay? So our sympathetic nervous system, when you're aroused by emotion, it goes into you know action. And then when that emotional moment calms down, then your parasympathetic takes over, okay? So there's a lot going on here. Uh, motivation, uh, biology, all of this is involved when it comes to emotion, okay? So this figure here talks about just the different biological areas and how the actual process works with the sympathetic nervous system being activated and the parasympathetic nervous system then calming you, okay? So like when you're hungry and you feel like you're really hungry, for example, what's really happening there, you know? Like, why am I getting all emotional? Because I'm hungry. <laughs> That's because my sympathetic nervous system is taking over and telling me what to do. And then once I get my food, I calm down, I feel relaxed, I'm happy all of a sudden, I've got what I need. That's my parasympathetic nervous system. The James Lang theory is this idea that emotions are influenced by how we interpret stimuli, okay? So it's our interpretation of stimuli from the social context that affects the way that we experience emotions and that we think about emotions, for example. Uh, the Schachter and Singer theory of emotions goes even further and says that there is this biological process when it comes to emotions. However, they are subjective to cognitive appraisal of stimuli from the social context, okay? So do we have a basic emotions? The idea of emotions is all emotions range on a category, okay? And different parts of your brain are responsible for different emotions. But it's all, again, if when the stimuli happens, it might stimuli different parts of the brain and other parts of the brain, and they all kind of start to, start to blend. So, that, so this idea of what are basic emotions is almost like asking what areas of the brain are being activated at different times, you know, so we can see which one is slightly different than the rest. Like which one, which part of the brain is doing happy emotions and which one's doing the negative emotions, for example. So we have our basic emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, disgust, and surprise, okay? So those arguably you could say they're universal, but it's more like the categorization and the labeling of these emotions is universal. To say that there's any universal emotion is really talking in ones and zeros. You're talking about neurons being stimulated, releasing neurotransmitters, because what is an emotion but a release of neurotransmitters, okay? So we've done facial testing to see if there are, you know, these facial expressions of emotions that are universal. And yeah, there are universal facial expressions, like our greet with a smile, our greet with our eyes, 
You know you really like someone when you smile at them, not only with your mouth, but with your eyes, whereas a politician might only smile with just their mouth, for example. Uh, so there are these universal ideas about facial expressions. However, to say that there are universal emotions is so culturally influenced because, again, emotions and the expressions of emotions, I guess, and the words we use to Label emotions are influenced by our culture, for example. So a culture that discourages anger might not have an emotion for anger. They might have something more for like frustration or something like that, for example, okay? Okay, so understanding facial expressions, again, there is this universal idea about that, okay? And that they express basic emotions. Okay, so what is the purpose of emotions? What do they serve? So emotions motivate us. The reason we get up out of bed in the morning is because our motivation, our drive is also attached to these emotional responses. You know, we are feeling things and that is causing our body and our brain to, to react, okay? So emotions serve a lot of purpose. They're also involved in moral reasoning, okay? This idea that we feel with our heart versus we feel with our mind. You know, what is actually going on? There's a lot to say that you're feeling with your heart, because we do feel with our body. And then we interpret what our body is sensing with our brain. And then we interpret this psych uh, social context with our brain, which then causes a biological response in us. Hence the biopsychosocial, okay? All right, so this idea about emotional intelligence is, you know, this is a big debate I always get in when I talk about differences between men and women, because it's always argued that women are slightly more communal. There are language areas of their brain are a little bit more developed than men. They have more neural pathways leading from their emotion centers to their cortex and the outer part of their brain. Do women actually have more emotional intelligence? And if they do, is it because genetically they have more intelligence? Is it because, you know, they're just socialized to be more in tune with emotions, or is it just how they how their brain works and how they interpret emotions? I don't know. I mean, that's a really fun debate when you're talking about male versus female differences. Um, but this idea about emotional intelligence has the four facets, perception, imagination, understanding, and then application of information, okay? And so all of us can sense each other's emotions because, again, we can put ourselves in an abstract way into the mind of somebody else and imagine what they might be thinking about anything, for example, okay? So we all have this sense of emotional intelligence. And do we have that because we work in groups? And because we've worked in groups, we've had to get a sense of how to work with each other. And so our emotions and emotional intelligence, these are evolutionary adaptations that have come about through millennia, okay? All right, so some specific emotions such as anxiety and fear. So anxiety has these biological responses. Again, activation of the sympathetic nervous system and not enough calming of the parasympathetic. Too much fight and flight, not enough chill and hang out, okay? So anxiety, an increase in the startle reflex, okay? So, um, Positive psychology is one way to help cope with the negative effects of stress and anxiety, for example, because it focuses on the, the happiness, the positive access of one's life, fulfilling their potential, finding their meaning, okay, having a positive self-view, improving overall well-being through body health and mind, okay? And so this is one way to kind of curb the anxiety, which is a biological response, okay? So how does somebody be happy to curb the anxiety? Again, you have associations between socioeconomic status and happiness and less stress. Uh, you have associations between health and less stress and less anxiety. Living in a country that enables you know, you to fulfill your potential without being prejudiced and discrimination or discriminatory against specific groups of people. Uh, having close relationships with other people because we all need that in our lives, okay? Uh, it's important for us to have a social life. Having goals in your life and being able to achieve them. Uh, attachments to religion, friends, being gratitude, positive attitude in general, okay? Being a type B person. All of these things tend to counter stress and anxiety, okay? And happiness level is fairly stable over time. But again, that's because socioeconomic factors also tend to stay pretty 
stable over time. Whatever class you're born into, you tend to stay into, okay? And then sadness, sadness is this idea of reacting to loss, and then crying again, a way of communicating sadness or distress to other people. Talked about with why is it when someone else is crying, all of a sudden I'm getting emotional. What's going on here, okay? Uh, so there's tons of emotions. We could go on for this forever, but embarrassment, shame, guilt, pride. Again, these are all just labels, things that we've socially constructed to account for these biological experiences of whatever it is we're feeling, okay? And then some of what we're feeling is great. It really motivates us to do good, but some of it causes that anxiety and that stress and that fear. And so what do we do to overcome that? You know, and this is, again, the whole idea of living the healthy lifestyle, uh, avoiding negative events, avoiding stressors, um, learning how to deal with stressors in a more positive way. Okay, because all of us, when we experience stressful events, we go through alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. And this process over time then becomes associated with things like cancer and heart disease, not just because stress, not like stress directly causes it, but because stress then reduces your immunity to things, okay, which enables cancer and things to come in and start causing a lot of problems, okay? So again, just like with emotions, we'll come up with lots of measures of stress. We can just ask you questions. We can, you know, monitor your physiological responses, for example. Um, again, but there are these indirect, indirect healths on like eating, sleeping, health, drinking, using drugs, and then direct effects, okay? Again, such as like the increased risk of cancer and heart disease, for example, okay? Because it compromises your immune system. And again, type A personalities, these very strong-minded, aggressive, controlling people tend to have a lot more high heart disease than more chilled out, more relaxed type B personalities, okay? So is there something toward your attitude on life and heart disease? And that's a funny thing to think about, how your attitude and your personality can be associated with like your overall physical health, but that's the beauty of the biopsychosocial picture is that, you know, your parents' socioeconomic status is you know, associated with your overall health because it's associated with your access to health care, to food, to nutrition, okay? In poverty, you see a lot more of malnutritioned kids, for example, these neglected children, and that affects people's development, okay? So same with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, such as, you know, in the military, traumatic experiences like car accidents, okay? These prolonged experiences of anxiety tend to have these very much more life-threatening um, problems. They are influenced by genetics, okay? Everything is influenced by genetics. Stress, the way you deal with stress, your personality type, the way you think, you know? A lot of that is based upon uh, genetics, but a lot of it is then, again, these socioeconomic and sociocultural factors that can really egg on things, okay? So again, to cope with stress, problem-focused coping, dealing with the problem itself, reappraising your situation to see if you want to end the situation or change it, focusing on the emotions that are causing stress, learning to become more resilient, for example, okay? So again, really good chapter. I love studying emotions because again, it's all this is just so new. We don't totally understand what's going on with emotions. We can put an EEG machine up and find out which parts of your brain are being activated when you're feeling emotional, but that doesn't always tell us everything we need to know, for example. So there's a lot of mystery still to emotion. Hence the biopsychosocial. What's happening to your body when you're getting emotional? What's going on in your mind? And then how is the social context, the stimuli coming from out here and you interacting with the stimuli influencing you? All right. Wish you all the best week. Have a great day.